introduce yourself and your involvement with WRDA. Okay, my name's Amy Weir. I currently work for Schenkel Women's Centre. I coordinate Greater North Belfast Women's Network. And my association with WRDA goes back probably, I'm saying 25 years, but it just might be that wee bit longer. Uh, I first came to WRDA and done the facilitation programme way back then and strangely enough my presentation of that at the end of my exam was networking because of the passion of networking and bringing people together. Uh, I currently, I have to say I passed my MVQ, MVQ, MVQ uh, and it was the first qualification that I had and it remains the first qualification that I have. I have loads of OCNs and things like that but for the qualification of MVQ and it sent me in a good space because now I facilitate right across uh, North and West Belfast and, and beyond. I'm currently, then back then I was the facilitator's representation on the management board uh, at that time but I moved and uh, things took over uh, and I then came off the management committee and I think five years ago maybe a wee bit more I was reintroduced to the board of WRDA and I am currently on the board of WRDA. Thank you Amy. Tell us a bit about yourself and your journey as a feminist. Uh, I suppose my journey I, I really didn't start with feminists. Uh, it's a thing that the feminists really don't like about me because I don't like using the word feminist. Uh, and partly because of that is the women that I work with at grassroots level don't see themselves as feminists. Uh, it's still a wee bit of a dirty word out there because of different things that has happened, you know radical feminism and things like that so I prefer not to use it uh, for myself that's not to say that I'm not a feminist but I don't like labels of any type of anybody uh, so but my journey without using the word feminist actually probably started within the trade union movement uh, when I joined the trade union movement in 75 I got involved in things that involved women. I was on the Women's Advisory Committee of the Transport and General Workers Union and I think that's where I got my beliefs of what was right and what was wrong and the way women were being treated. Uh, so I joined the trade union movement to make a difference and I through the trade union ranks for 20 years I made a difference within the Women's Advisory Committee of the of the trade union on equal pay for employment, all the stuff that came out all in around that time. Uh, we fought long and hard for the Equal Pay Act, weren't happy with the Equal Pay Act, and then we fought to get equal pay for equal value. So, you know, that's where I would say my feminist views, my point of views is on a rights-based campaign which uh, I still do today uh, and the training that I got through the trade union movement. So after leaving the trade union movement uh, when I was made redundant uh, I then came heavily involved in community and I came heavily involved in community within the women's movement. Shankill Women's Centre I actually volunteered there first after my redundancy and I then was able to continue to make, or hopefully try to make lives different for women and try to make a difference within a community setting rather than a trade union setting. Thank you, Amy. What was the impact of the troubles on the Women's Resource and Development Agency and the Women's Movement more generally? I, I think you know, the, the women's centres and the women's organisations were established in the early 80s. Uh, and I think part of the reason for that to be established, there was nothing out there for women or where women could go. Uh, you know, 
men were in the bars and at that time women didn't go into bars on their own, you know, way back to them old days, olden days. Uh, and, you know, I can only talk about, you know, my knowledge of Shankar Women's Centre that women got together and gathered in their in their houses to help and support each other. And it was really somewhere that women could go to have that conversation and to be educated because they became the breadwinners in in the homes and you know women didn't particularly get educated that well uh you know in schools because they were to leave school get a job get married have kids and be the housewife so education became a, a big thing within Shankar Women's Centre uh, and then they were able to get a wee bottom floor unit uh, on the Shankar uh, which I called the Hummingbird and women started coming in to get educated and child care was a big issue then and it still is a big issue now so you know we're going back to the early 80s and child care was the main thing that stopped women from being educated and that just went on but then there was a lot of other stuff that was happening within communities uh you know domestic violence was was, was one women you know having to go up and down to the prisons to visit the men that were in prisons who were getting three meals a day and a bed to sleep in every night but women were actually struggling to actually kids food work everything so the, the, the weight of the troubles as such, if you weren't in prison, you had all the work to do, especially if you were, you became a lone parent, a single parent overnight and with all the stuff that was happening within communities, with all the, the, the conflict that was going on, with not knowing, you know, money was scarce then and scarce now uh, for, for those communities. A lot of stuff that we done or I done, you know, and really even within the trade union movement, but before probably the Good Friday Agreement and during that conflict, women were still meeting, women were still coming together, but we done an awful lot out of it under the radar for the safety of the women, because it was always about safety of the women. There's not a women's centre that I know of that you can just walk into. You have to ring a bell to get in and that was put in as a safety mechanism so estranged partners couldn't just come into the women's centre and start a row with their, 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 their partners. So, you know, it was a safe, secured place that women could come in, have that cup of tea, have that cup of coffee, join in on an education class if they wanted to, but they didn't necessarily have to. It was a drop-in facility for women who were suffering, uh, being traumatised, who maybe needed help in, in counselling or finance help and education. So we done an awful lot of stuff under the radar. Although there were some protests that people came together on the time that they, they uh, were going to close the Royal Maternity Hospital, you know, Shankland Falls got together and protested in the, uh, out on the ground about the uh, closure of the maternity hospital and it didn't close. So, you know, protests and calm work. I, I would say a lot of my experience through the conflict was through the trade union movement, through working in, in, in the factory that I worked in. And, you know, it was, especially the early 70s, it was really hard, you know, hitting a lot of, you know, I lived it. You know, I mean, I was 14 when it started, you know, uh, and, and, and 44 when it finished, you know, so <laughs> you had all those years of, of, of you know, you had the, the Loyalist strike, you had the Bloody Sunday, you had Bloody Friday, you had all these things that was happening, you know, in the communities and women wore the ones that were picking up the pieces in their houses, even within industry, you know going out to work and having to go out to work because you probably were the only breadwinner in the home. You know, so it wasn't easy and, and again, women seemed to get the blunt.
bump and roll because a lot of men were were in prison or they were involved in in the organizations the the paramilitary organization the combatant organizations that was out there hi Jerry um do you think um paramilitarism we have moved on um but do you think paramilitarism still exercises um a degree of control over the women's movement in certain areas today I would say they don't hold a control over them because that's that's a word that we don't recognise within women's centres. That the people who control women's centres are the people who use the women's centres, who come into the women's centres. But uh, there's occasions that they don't make it easy. Uh, you know, there has been a number of women's centres that have been attacked because they have had somebody in visiting, maybe coming from south uh maybe coming into their building i think one mary robinson came uh i think at the open windsor women's center and then brand new center was actually burnt you know out so you get that intimidation but they're faceless and and, and you can't come you can't do anything about faceless you know they're not that proud to, to, to actually come and sit down around the table and have a conversation of what their issues are and to listen to why things happen within the women's centres. The, the other thing is paramilitarism, as far as I'm concerned, is a way. But there is certain ones there who are carrying a badge of paramilitarism that is a front for organised crime. And unfortunately, that in our communities, we still have a lot of that. We have, I use the word gatekeepers, who speak on behalf of communities, who don't even talk to the communities that they're speaking on behalf of. And I don't think there's any one organisation can speak for everybody. I certainly can't speak for all women. I can speak for the women that I speak to, but I can't speak for all women. I can't speak for the Shanko Road. I can't speak for Tigers Bay, but I can speak on behalf of women who live in those areas who actually come in contact with me. So there's no one organisation can state that they speak for everybody because they don't. How do you feel the feminist movement in Northern Ireland, or perhaps the women's, women's movement, movement. Uh, has, has changed over the last 40 years? I believe that the women's movement is the best well-oiled machine and organisation that there is, probably in Europe and not just in Northern Ireland, because we work together, doesn't matter who you are or where you're from. We don't use the orange and green card because we have a lot of women from different countries, different races, and different agendas within women, and we listen to them all. The women's movement listens to them all. There's organisation, there's networkers within it, there's joint lobbyist groups, joint women's feminist groups, and it's fed in right through the movement. And, you know, working in the women's centres, even when you look at our procedures, within our financial procedures, within our, our uh, rules, within within the, the organisations, it, it's a, a non-threatening environment. Uh, we don't no longer have to hide to go into women's centres, where probably 40 years ago, I probably wouldn't have been free enough during what was happening even just in the late 90s before the Good Friday Agreement to openly walk out and go over to Falls Women's Centre and go into Falls Women's Centre, which we did do, but you had to actually see, get get there maybe in a different way. So now it's a lot freer where we move freely without trying to hide, where we did have to when the conflict was, was really hard. But, you know, I mean, there's fantastic, you know, I mean, I work with all organisations all the women's centres I work across north and west, south and east Belfast and we're integrated 
That's not to say that there isn't problems within it, but you know, if the women's movement's well oiled machine was up in Stormig, it would be an actual, you know, a lesson learned from those people who think that they can run things and decide things. But women talk about the issues and no one person makes a decision. It comes from the movement and not just from individuals. Thank you, Ellen. Yes, so it, it has quite a collective character, the women's movement. There's a lot of consensus seeking, I suppose. Mm. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, you've always been outspoken about <laughs> women's rights um, and what you see happening in the um, area where you work and live. I think it's fair to say that that's not easy. Um, I'm thinking in particular about the reaction to your participation in the NI Affairs Select um, Committee panel and other incidents. Can you tell us a bit about that and how you deal with abuse and harassment as an outspoken woman? Well, it goes with the job. And, and one of the reasons why the network was set up was to be a conduit for women to be able to speak out about what was happening in their communities but they feared speaking out within their communities. So the network was set up, one of the, re one of the reasons it wasn't the only reasons was that if there was issues within communities and women were fearful or they were seeing things that were happening, they could actually bring it to the table at the network and then I would approach on behalf of the network and not on behalf of that individual or on behalf of that area. It would be done with so nobody could be singled out. Unfortunately, I was the one that was doing the speaking. So I would be the one that would be singled out for any harassment or anything else. And the incident that you're, 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 you're talking about, it, that I was fearful probably for the first time in my life. And I lived through the conflict. And I was fearful of my own community at that time. And I've never felt that fear before. And it wasn't uh, that, you know, there was a tweet put out and Jimmy Bryson put a tweet out. And I'm saying that publicly because it was a fact. He put a tweet out saying things that I had said that took out of a half an hour conversation. He took two things that I had said out of a half an hour conversation. If he had retweeted the whole conversation, it couldn't have been construed the way that it was construed. And because I had made a comment about the Loyalist Community Council not representing everybody, it went viral. Not only me, but the other five women that were with me, but unfortunately I was the only name that, that was mentioned. And I live not on the Shankle now, but you know, I live within that community. And there was a lot happening in the community at that time with the protocol and everything that was going on. And it wasn't Jimmy Bryson that I feared, not at all. I feared the young people that were being roped in to that whole social media rant and so, you know, anti-social behaviour. And I was fearful that something would happen to me or my car or something through at my house because I live on an interface. So it took me a long while, and you did start off that I speak out, and I speak out, you know, based on what I'm being told by the women that I work with. And I was told, and we had took advice through the Equality Commission and, and, and different organisations, and we were told not to respond in any one way. That took me about months to actually get my cognitive dissidence changed because I normally would have approached the individual and had a conversation with them to get my point across but I was advised and told not to do that. Now in hindsight I had great women around me supporting me WRDA was one of those organisations that rallied round, along with other organisations that rallied round, along with my network, they rallied round and supported me. But it's still I had that fear 
within me. But in saying that, on hindsight, I think it was the best advice because now I can shake Jimmy Bryson's hand and say thank you for reaching my words to all your followers because I could have never reached that amount of people. And the responses that I was getting in, phone calls, emails, and people stopped me in the street saying, you were right. They don't speak for everybody. And they do speak for people, but not for everybody. And my point was that you have to listen to the voices that are not being heard, and not only the voices that are being heard. Thank you, Ellie. And um, was that, um, I, I remember looking at the news coverage and everything that was happening on um, social media during, during that time, and um, it was incredible because we hadn't had anything like that in a long while, and it, it was shocking to me to say that, that was the first time that um, you fear for your safety, having lived through everything else yeah. that's, that's, that's happening here. So it's it's very brave of you to continue to speak out um, so very much so. Um, do you think, that, like I said, there was five women on, on that panel and um, you know everyone got a, a touch but because you were named you were a particular target. Do you think that it's it's harder for women from the loyalist community um, to put themselves out there and to be outspoken whenever it goes against um, maybe more kind of well-known sort of um, loyalist community narratives? Yeah, I, I do. And it probably goes back probably to my trade union days really as well. Because when I was within the trade union movement throughout from 75, so, you know, you're talking the big, the biggest bulk of, of the, the, the conflict here. And, you know, I can remember hearing things and being at the, 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 the Women's Advisory Committee and all of them. You know what I mean? There was people on that Women's Advisory Committee that I didn't know at that time, know them now. Like, you know what I mean? Ma Abla Kamari was the women's officer, you know. Monica McWilliams was was on that committee and May Blood was on that committee. So and you know, these were even then weren't known. Monica probably would have been known because she had done a fantastic book on domestic violence around that time. So, you know, I was hearing things around that table and I was hearing from women who lived in West Belfast. I was hearing from women who lived in South Belfast. But I also because it was an amalgamated transport and general workers union it was a north south so i was hearing views from the south as well i wasn't hearing none of that within my own community because she didn't have a contact with anybody else in other communities because you lived and breathed your own community you, everything you done you done within your own community so i mean the 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 light went on for me when, when i joined that trade union movement so i led very much a double life I done all my campaigning and all my shouting and all my things around the trade union movement, within the trade union movement, but couldn't say anything of that in my own community. I'll give you for instance that when it became strip searching in Armagh Women's Prison, and it happened to be Republican women prisoners that were being searched, in my community that was a Republican issue. And I believed that it was a Republican issue because it was Republican women that were being strip searched. Within the trade union movement, that was a human rights issue. And it wasn't a Republican issue. So I campaigned against strip searching in Armagh within the trade union movement. I couldn't have went home and said that I was campaigning against strip searching in Armagh because I would have been, it would have been seen that I was supporting the Republican movement. That's how I'm narrow-minded. At that time, everything was. And I'm not saying it was anybody's fault. It's just that's the way it was then. And there was very few, and there's been a few, there's been a few Muslim women. My blood's one. You know, Betty, Betty Sinclair is another one. You know, I mean, we have women from a Protestant tradition, you know, speaking out 
uh, unfortunately there's a lot who fear speaking out uh, because unionism is divided you know if it wasn't divided we would only have one unionist party but we don't we have two you know so there is a, a division within unionism and not all unionists believe the same thing or, or, or believe the same way so it's a wee bit more complex within uh, Protestant communities and, and it is that wee bit harder. I think what would make it easier, to be honest, if we could actually introduce a 1325 UENR resolution where women would be around the table and then men would get used to those women and what they're actually saying. They're not fighting or what they argue against people. They just want their point of view put across. An odd example of us being invited to the uh, Westminster, the, the Northern Ireland's Affairs Committee. You know, that was the first time that the women's movement was invited to something like that, to get a seat at the table. And then we were harassed for doing it. And I don't want to take anybody else's opinion away from them, but allow us to have ours without that intimidation attached to it. Thank you, Ellen. Um, you were one of the first community facilitators trained by Women's Resource and the Women Agency all of those 25 years ago. Um, can you tell us about the origin of the um, community facilitator programme? You know, I got to hear about it, you know, I was working part-time. I was volunteering and I was working part-time in Shanko Women's Centre. Now the facilitators program, which I thought was great, if you're working you can't do it because a facilitators program is to try and encourage you to get into work, to, to, to earn some money. But because I was part time I qualified because I wasn't in a full time job. And you know, it, it was scary for me at that time because I realised later on in life, probably not later on in life, but probably my last years of school, that I have a dyslexia and it really scarred me uh, that I'm going to go here and do this MVQ facilitation and how am I going to do the MVQ so because of my dyslexia and everything else but in saying that the way the course was run out uh, you know you had time uh, you know it takes so many to read something you know to read it in five minutes it'll take me ten minutes you know so it takes me longer to do things than, than, than what I, I, I'm not very good at putting things on paper. Uh, I, I sort of I can't put down how I think, you know, it's, it's all the, the words all hit me up the face and everything else. But nevertheless, I done that facilitation course and the origin of that was to get women in the employment. And, and I, I have to say, you know, it was not long after that I got a full time job. Uh, in, in, in Chango Women's Centre but you know doing that actually broke a lot of barriers for me personally because of my dyslexia uh, it's, it, it's only when I'm asked to do something to write a report can you get me that report by the end of the day that will never happen you know I know it will never happen and, and I, I have to say my, my, my manager and people understand that and, and, and give you that wee bit more of the time to do it, but it doesn't stop me doing my job. Uh, it doesn't stop me speaking out because I can speak out rather than read a speech. I, I, I don't do things like that. But the, you know, I mean, the origin of that to me, and, and it was a Belfast based that time, you know, I done it here in these premises in, 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 in uh, my chores, and I got to meet people that I wouldn't have met, wouldn't have, wouldn't have came across. And actually it was one of those and Bernie, who Bernie and I, she fought, she was campaigning at that time for uh, Cancer Lifeline, uh, for premises uh, in Ardoyne. And I was chairperson of WISPA at the time and we got WISPA to do a, a, a charity walk, men and all wearing bras up and down your shankle and filled buckets. And we actually bought a lot of bricks, but that came through me meeting her at WRDA on a facilitation program and a lot of the women I still see every now and again and 
and there's a bond there because we were in the room together and there's a bond there that lasts us till today and we still come across each other every now and again and, and, and it's great just to do that wee bit of so it's not just about educating you you're also getting involved with other people and meeting different people that you wouldn't normally meet you've been involved in women's education and development programs throughout your long career um how has women's community-based education changed over over that time if it has changed i would say change i don't know if changes were more demand that's that's a change uh you know there's a change that we're being we didn't see very much of the peace dividend come into the areas of the organizations that worked through the conflict uh we probably were getting more money prior to the good friday agreement you know which wasn't an awful lot at that time but then we didn't have the same amount of women but over the years women coming when the husbands got out and their partners got out of prison women actually were coming and, and wanting to get educated wanting to have a better job wanting to be able to 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 bring into the family their their wages and uh, the courses that we put on now in comparison to the courses that were put on years ago like we're doing gcse english gcse uh mas we're doing uh you know because we have a lot of people who, who our education system let down and we have people coming in for basic english and basic maths uh, and then they move on into the GCSE level. There's counselling courses. There's, you know, there's umpteen. Uh, you know, when you look at the, the across the women's sector the, uh, and look and see the different things that are happening in different women's centres, you know, there's therapies, there's counselling, there's, uh, you, you know, we meet the needs of, of the communities and the, and the people that come in. And that's one of the ethos that it's not us to put the program in, it's what we're being asked for to put on because there's demand. You know, I mean, we're, we're, we've done sign language classes as well. We've done Spanish classes as well. You know, so it's it, every year it may change, but we have, we're inundated. You know, Shango Women's Centre uh, in particular moves from a, a one room, uh, two rooms. Uh, now we're in a building with three, four rooms. And now we're getting a new build that's being built on uh, just off the interface at Lamarck Way. So if the demand wasn't there, well, why would they build us or why were we able to secure a brand new building? And it's because we have the demand big difference now is our childcare we're not getting proper childcare funding we're not getting funding we have a brand new building but we need workers to go and work in those buildings you know so that we can actually encourage women from the communities to to go and get educated you know me i done my figures last year you know many women i worked with who had went through different programs that i had put on and my programs are slightly different than the education program, although it's education, uh, because mine's good relations, peace building. And my figures was 500 women I worked with, me alone. That's not counting the education department in Shanko Women's Centre. That's not counting our young women's project in Shanko Women's Centre. And that's not actually counting our health and wellbeing project. So, you know, there's 30 members of staff now where before there was maybe six members of staff so the change is the demand from the communities and in particular from women and because that demands are our funding is being cut uh, a lot of the women's centers are really going with cap and ran uh, even now because Part of it is because Stormont's not up and running. Not that I think that, that would make a big difference anyway as far as the money's concerned. But I believe, I personally believe, that we need to be looking at... I have 
a lot of time for our tourism industry. I think we need our tourism industry, but if the community workers and the women at grassroots level weren't doing what they were doing, there wouldn't be a tourism trade here because we're doing the good relations, the peace building, the education, the health and well-being, and, uh, and looking after our, our young women, our, our, our single parents and, and things like that. And if we weren't doing all that, we would have conflict. We would have been rioting on the ground. And who wants to come to visit Belfast when there's riots? Mm -hmm. Nobody. And the same with industry. Industry is able to set up businesses here because it's peace and we have peace. But it's been the people at grassroots level who has maintained that peace, whether it's through education, whether it's through the programs that we put in place. Businesses again are here and they're all being invested in. Our tourism is being invested in, our business, uh, and even more so now because of the the single market that we're, we're able to access through the European Union. So businesses is going to be very wealthy and big investment going into those areas, which is needed. So I want investment in the women's movement, not funding, fest, investment, invest in us, because if you invest in us, these businesses is going to have employees that will be able to do the work. Thank you. I guess it, it does seem that there's a real kind of um, disparity there in the work that the women's movement has been doing and the money that it gets for that work. So it's interesting what you're saying there. We have seen um, increased demand for our services. Um, we're offering a broader range, but we're getting. <coughs> were less valued for it, or, you know. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll mention about, I, I would also like to be saying something about women's work and unpaid work mm -hmm. because women within communities are current, they're either current for maybe uh, somebody with a disability within their, their family with their children, but they're also maybe current for an elderly parent as well and our elderly parents who are able are doing the child nighting that they allow the mothers to go and get educated or go out and get a, a part-time job somewhere so the unpaid work that women are doing in the communities when it's based on on the current rules and the child care rules probably saves 360 billion pound a year i think there's something in that in that figure it it is all of that work of what um I think Marxist theorists call um social social reproduction work. Yeah. That's yeah. all done by women and there there is very little value attached to that work even though our society couldn't function without it. Yeah. 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 And, and and the women's movement and the women's centres and you know, and that takes in everybody, it takes in WRDA, you know. We're dealing with the trauma of these women who have lived through the conflict, who have passed down that trauma to their younger people, and we're working with those people too. And having something to do on a daily basis or even on a weekly basis helps with that trauma, helps with that mental health. And to be able to actually say, I'm going down to have a cup of tea and I'm going to do a wee class down in, the, in, 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 in a centre, you know, that to some people is life-changing and it keeps the waiting lists down in the hospitals as well so if we weren't there you know there would be an awful lot more people suffering a lot of mental health issues and, and dealing with trauma as well as the lack of, of especially the cost of living and not being educated to be able to get a decent job to be able to afford even a wee weekend away with their family you know and that's not really being unrealistic that Women in particular and families need time together, need a break, but at the cost of living, let's feed, heat, you know, especially school uniforms, the price of school uniforms and everything else. And it's mainly, I'm not saying it's, there's no men suffering that, but it's mainly women, you know, who, who carry the con, who do the thing to give the others. Thank you, Ellie. I guess that's undeniably true. Um, you mentioned there earlier that you now serve on the um, women's resource and development agencies management committee. I was wondering if you could just outline your role on the management committee. 
So my role on, well, I don't know whether it's my role or not, it's, it's what I say, you know, maybe what my role is, uh, that uh, <coughs> there's a mixture of, of, of skills on, on the uh, management committee, and sometimes I question what's my skill, but I, you know, I'm in touch. I'm in touch with what's happening at grassroots level uh, because I work across the areas that I work across and the amount of people that, that I'm in contact with and the amount of people that I network with. So, you know, to me, I think I bring that to the table that I know what's happening, I know the conversations that's going on. Uh, and when there's something that comes to the management committee, I would like to think that I have a, an input when it comes to that there's something going to be done within WRDA is that uh, reinventing the wheel because there's no point in reinventing the wheel because that money could go to something better if there's something else that's doing it. So, you know, it's a very passionate committee. Uh, can be hard, hard work at times. And in particular, the way that WRDA has the women lobbyists and doing different proposals, check her strategies and all these things. You know, it's very, you know what I mean, professional, which I'm not. But uh, I, when it comes to making lives better for women and better for different groups of women, uh, <clears throat> I'm all in there. Uh, and I like to think that I bring that grassroots knowledge to that table uh, to be discussed, to have part of that conversation and and just make sure that WRDA is doing what WRDA what it says on the tin, you know, and, and I have to say uh, every time I try to get away, somebody else decides from the management committee or, or they're moving, they're moving country and uh, I'm here for an hour away. Well, I think it's good to bring new blood into it, and I think that's part of the the last year at the AGM. We brought four new women, younger women, and I think that's very, very important for us to recognise. Uh, as we get older, we need to be passing on our knowledge to our the younger generation to come in and fill the roles, but still keep the ethos of the organisation going. So it's very, very important to to bring new blood in at all levels, uh, not just at board level, but also at grassroots level as well. Okay, and yes, um, we're not going to let you um, escape any time soon. <laughs> um, just to pick up on what you were saying there, um, do you think that our Magic Pity accurately reflects the women's movement here? I think so. I, I think so. And that's not to say that we don't have you know, heated debates and so sometimes, and, uh, and again, we're women, we're all talking, we're all there for the right reasons, we're all there for the same thing, but we want to make sure it's done right. Uh, I, I think they are, because we need the people here around that table. You know, we have somebody who, who, who you know, has been in a role and the, the trust, you know, that the health issue is a big issue, you know, with women. Uh, we have somebody there who, who, who is very okay with finance, you know, and, and we have people there from ethnic minority groups background. You know, we're not saying we're, 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 it's perfect, but it, in the main, it's a good reflection of civic society. And that's what we need to have. And civic society, is all there. I'm not saying that I think we are talking about maybe looking again of recruiting again and sort of we saying who it is we want on it. Not who it is we want on it, but we would encourage people from a certain background to consider coming on because I think the, the, the focus, uh, I know particularly last year, was to look at who we've got and who it is we need and to try and recruit and have a reflection of civic society around that table. And I think, you know, we're not perfect, but we can always improve. 
I don't think any organisation party, uh, we always are looking to improve and we're always looking to make a difference. Thank you Eileen. Um, what are you most proud of um, from your long career um, and also what do you feel is WRDA's greatest achievement? everything <laughs> that we do well, I, I'm proud of personally I'm proud of the women that I work with because they take risks every day in life they're the ones that struggle and if I can do something to make life a wee bit easier for those women then I'm proud you, you, you know achievements achievements not really there for me you know I'm out there, I do my job, I want to make a difference and I believe that I am making a difference. Even if I make a difference for one person's life, I make a difference and, and those women are having a better life now than what they did half years and years ago and, and I don't know if it's achievements. I think the thing that changed me personally, I think I was lucky enough, some people would say unfortunate enough, but I was lucky enough to do a joint project with Shankill Women's Centre, Falls Women's Centre and Windsor Women's Centre and it was to go up and work with the women up in the prison, preparing them for to come out of prison because a lot of them were institutionalised uh, and I learned an awful lot about me. Uh, I would have said prior to that I was non-judgmental. I didn't realise that I was judgmental and I found that out because the first day that I went into prison on my own to work with the women, I was panicking and I'm going, well, why am I panicking? But I was panicking because I was walking into a prison. So I just changed my mindset and said, I'm walking into an our women's centre here because that's all it was. Because there was nobody in that prison that I actually hadn't came across in a women's centre or a women's organisation. We all had those issues. So, you know, those realising that within myself, uh, it changed me for the better, I hope. But there's still probably a lot more changes. I, I don't think I have chi achieved what I want. I want to her for all, you know. So uh, if we were to get the things that, that, that we, we have lobbied for and the things that we protest every, every hour a week for, uh, that would be great. But the fact that I have been able to work across the community for the last 28 years, I think it's an achievement of its own, to be honest with you, you know, to keep going and still keep that passion. Uh, and it is a passion. Uh, I don't want to go back to the bad old days and I want women, and in particular our younger women that's coming through now, to have a better life than, than what we went through for 30 years. WRDA, I think we have achieved an awful lot over the years, you know, even within the staff. Uh, I think that you're sitting here recording me is, is an achievement. And our, the website, the information that goes out from WRDA, the membership list, you know, it, it, it just goes on and on and on. And again, the fact that it's not out on its own, because there was a time where it was WRDA on its own. The fact that the women's centres and the women's organisations, uh, both urban and rural, are all sitting down working together. To me, that's a big achievement. Uh, in particular, when there's so much differences within communities. Uh, now you have the urban, but you have big differences within rural. So it's sitting around the table and making sure what is decided actually was right across the province and not just in Belfast, it was right across. And the fact that the facilitation programs out around the country now, it's not just Belfast, you know, and I think the fact that you are a regional organisation and reaching out to those regional organisations that the like of me can't do because I'm based in a certain area, uh, but WRDA can reach out and, and I know they have reached out, you know, they have been in Newry, they have been 
Alan Min and Ballon Money, you know, Belfast, Cookstown, and, and I think that's a great achievement that we're taking the word out to those communities who, who wouldn't have the luxury of having a women's centre on their doorstep. Thank you, Ellie.